Well, Rob, thank you for leading Cousin Stewart's song there. We don't sing that in church very often, and uh, it's a good song. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you this evening. I don't think our young people are back yet from Clearwater. At least they're not in the room. We look forward to them returning safely and hope that they've had a good evening and they'll be joining us. I just know they'll be back in time for cake and ice cream and, and we'll all be there too. Welcome to our guests. We have several guests tonight and we're so pleased to have you. We're always thrilled when guests come, Sunday nights, maybe more than Sunday mornings, because uh, there are fewer of us, and it just it makes us so happy that you choose to be here, and we're glad to have you. Everybody remember that tomorrow night, I've got an appointment. You are invited, but I'll be expected to be there at the Chisholm Trails Church at 7 o'clock. They are bravely reaching out to start a gospel meeting. My custom has been to Think of those as, uh, as lectureships more often when you got a different speaker every night rather than the gospel meeting terminology, but they are having a different speaker each time. Larry Scarf this morning and uh, somebody else this evening. I'm tomorrow, then the youth minister from over at River Walk, and then I think the uh, preacher over at uh, Madison Avenue is Wednesday night. But you're invited every one of the times, but your presence is solicited tomorrow night and uh, would be so honored to have you there if you are available. The theme is uh, dealing with the book of Nehemiah and my subject is don't give up, don't, don't lose heart and uh, keep on keeping on. Those are the things that I'll be talking about tomorrow night. Now, Tonight, I'll try to control my timing again, and uh, we'll see how well that works. I want to speak on a very unpopular subject. Uh, there was a poll that I saw on Facebook during the last week, and someone asked the question, what do you believe are the most unpopular verses from the Bible these days? And of course, a lot of people ventured a lot of different individual scriptures, passages. My opinion was that the ones that are least popular today are the ones that call out, point out, specify sin. Because people just don't like to hear about sin. They, they like to hear about something that's fun, something that's stimulating, something that's encouraging. But sin just isn't a popular subject to be discussed. On the other hand, sin is a very, very popular thing to do. In fact, that's been a primary focus of people ever since the Garden of Eden, hasn't it? The world is a stage in which everything you can think of in the world often gets played out. Repetitiously, it's played out over and over again. But what, which of those sins do you believe is the most dangerous one? Which one is the most likely? When you say a sin is dangerous, I, I think every sin is dangerous. The scriptures say that the consequence of sin is death. You remember, that's what Paul said in Romans chapter 6. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But when you talk about dealing with sin, you're dealing with something that is a fatal error. If you continue in sin, it's not going to be a pretty picture. It's not going to have a good ending. It's going to be fatal spiritually. It may be fatal very early, but when it comes to judgment, the scriptures teach that sinners aren't going to heaven. They aren't going to be eternally saved. Particularly if you thought you're okay, you'd be really, really surprised at judgment if all at once you learn, I've been in sin, and sin's gonna condemn me. I thought I was okay. I didn't do a thing. And some people will probably try to explain it to God that way. I didn't do anything. 
Do you think that's going to convince him? Or will it in fact be self-incriminating? Usually, whenever we think about sins, we would go to places like the book of Galatians and the book of First Corinthians where there's kind of a spelling out of the a catalog of sins. And I thought this evening we might begin by reading in both those places for just a moment. Not because it's inspirational, not because you're going to say, boy, I'm glad we went over that because that's so encouraging, but to be aware of the things that we're talking about when we're talking about sin. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 6, the Lord spells out some things that will really, really get you into trouble. I want to start, uh, let's see, what's the best place to, to begin here whenever he says, uh, in verse 18, let's start with that. Flee, he says, from sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside of the body, but sexual immorality, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you and whom you have from God and you are not your own for we're bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now he's been speaking about sin earlier in the chapter. In verses 9 and following, he said, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not be deceived. Neither will the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, or revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Of such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So he just lists a catalog of the kinds of sins that will keep people out of heaven. Those are things that you say, well, every one of those is dangerous, every one of them is condemning, but I'm not suggesting yet that these are the most dangerous sins. Though they're serious, they ought to be taken into serious account, and they ought not to be characteristic of the lives of any of us. With a church there in Corinth, Paul said, some of you used to do those things. Those are the very kinds of sin that you were committing. But, he said, you've been washed. The washing would suggest that these are people who've repented of their sins and with faith in Jesus Christ they'd been baptized for the remission of sins and his blood had washed them clean and although they had committed these deplorable sins, the grace of God had forgiven them. Some today maintain that some of those sins are such that you really couldn't and shouldn't be held responsible for because they're not a matter of choice. But the Apostle Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, seemed to very clearly say that you did these things, you were responsible, but now you're not because you have been cleansed. Now, another passage that lists a good number of sins in the same way is Galatians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 16, Paul there lists the sins we like to get past the sins and down to where he speaks of the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the good things. Those are the things we ought to do and we seek to do. But beginning in verse 16, he said, now I'm at 14, I want to be in uh, chapter 15, verse 19. He said, now the works of the flesh are are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, 
dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They all are things that are not positive contributions to society. They all are things that deprive other people of their rights. They are things that disrupt the community and the life of individuals who might otherwise be living in unity and in peace. And they take away the freedoms of others as well, as they may be forced into participation. But they all are damning, to say the least. Now, he does go on and to give us a breath of fresh air at this point, having gone over all those unsavory things. But he said, the fruits of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such, he says, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified themselves with its passions and desires. The ones who are in the Lord have reached the point where they have decided to do those things that are righteous and good and positive and helpful. But he said those of the world who continue in those other kinds of sins are dooming themselves. That's an unsavory group of, of things. We sometimes speak of sins as being, well, we think of them that way as being big sins and little sins, don't we? If you were listing all the different kinds of sins that there might be categorically, almost surely you'd say that the worst of those sins would be some of the ones that are listed here. Murder would be one of them. Raping would be one of them, wouldn't it? And some of the things that people even do today with the benefit of the law might be something that would belong in there as a, a real sin. Lying and stealing and cheating have always been contrary to the will of God. Sexual immorality has never been approved. It's never been given. Many forms of sexual immorality are mentioned in the Bible, and they're mentioned many times, but not one time is any one of them ever mentioned in any good light. But we're never given a place where there's a list and they say, this is the worst one, and this is the next one, and that's the next one. Avoid this one because it's number four. That, that listing isn't there. Which one? Which sin is most dangerous? Well, the fact is that I haven't mentioned it yet. The sin that I believe is the most dangerous has not been listed in this list that we've read in either one of those passages. What do you think it is? I believe it's the sin of neglect. Just like that person might go to judgment and say, Lord, I haven't done anything. And the Lord might say, exactly, exactly. You haven't done anything. You have skipped all the commandments. You have failed to observe all the things that you ought to do that you were instructed to do, the scriptures told you to do, and you haven't done anything. You have neglected the responsibilities that people are supposed to be fulfilling. James chapter four, verse 17 says, for to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, it is sin. And so neglect, neglect of what ought to be done is a sin. And there are other passages that seem to add up to the very same thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 14, the apostle Paul urged Timothy, do not neglect the gift that has been given to you by the laying on of hands of the apostles and the elders. He said, do you do what God has called you to do, how he's blessed you. He's blessed you to, to do, obviously, to preach because in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he told him, preach the word 
comfort, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So that's what he's called to do. And in another place he said he has ordered, do the work of an evangelist. You preach and teach and share the good news. And to neglect that would have meant that Timothy was sinning. He had the opportunity, he had the calling, he had the gifts, and he would be able to do it. But if he didn't do it, he said, It'll, you'll be failing. When Hebrew writer, writer starts the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, he makes a decided effort in that first chapter, though he didn't divide it into chapters, to to do what he's going to do through the whole book, and that is to lift up Jesus. He writes it to the Hebrews, that is to Jewish people who had become Christians, and he writes it to them wanting to communicate to them that you made the right choice when you became Christians, when you gave up the Judaistic kind of religion, the Mosaical law, and you came over into Christianity and were members of the Lord's church. You made the right decision, but don't give up and don't quit now. Don't go back because Jesus is Lord and he's above all the angels and everybody that ever lived, he's above all. You made the right choice. Whenever he's finished that chapter as we have it divided and has established that Jesus is above even the angels, he said, therefore, your translation might say, wherefore, he said, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip we ought to listen. We ought, to, we ought to, to really focus on what God has said from his word to us, and we ought not to ever let any of that slip. Hold it. Maintain it. The, the Proverbs once said, buy the truth, sell it not. This, this is the idea. You get hold of it, and you know. He said, for the word that was spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward. Here's the question in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation that began to be spoken to us by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those that heard him, the Lord God himself bearing them record by the miracles and wonders and signs that he did. You see, don't neglect. How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? He would bring that out further in chapter 10 and verse 25 when he said, if you go on sinning willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. He's not saying that there's no hope for you. He's saying, Jesus has been sacrificed for the sake of your sins. He's died for your soul. His blood has been shed to wash away your sins. And he's saying, folks, if that's not good enough for you, understand this, it doesn't get any better. This is the top of the mountain. God giving Jesus you, you can't ask for something better than that. And so the question remains there from verse 3. How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You see, there's so many people who have had an opportunity to become Christian and they didn't. Even some that are talked about later in that book and are other places in Scripture who became Christians and then they gave it up. They turned back. The apostle Peter said of those, for if they have once escaped the pollution of the world and they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end for them is worse than the beginning. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from it. And it's happened to them according to the true proverb, the dog has returned to his vomit again. What an ugly, ugly picture he's drawing. But he's trying to say it's serious, serious business in the eyes of God. And the sow that was washed has returned to her wallowing in the mire. What a waste. If you wash a pig, 
turn it loose and it goes right back into the barnyard, into the slop and the muck of that barnyard and rolls and wallows in it, you wasted your time. He's using that to illustrate the fact that if somebody has had the opportunity to taste the grace of God and they turn away from the best that there is, what a waste it is. They've neglected the salvation that was offered to them, that they've come to enjoy and then forfeited because of their neglect. In that same book, chapter 5 and verse 12, he said to some of these people, for the time you ought to be teachers. In other words, you've had long enough to grow spiritually, enough to be people who are teaching other people. Looking at the amount of time that you've been Christian, you ought to be teachers. But he said, you have need that someone would teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You've forgotten the basics. You've drifted. you stumbled. You neglected to grow. You didn't study. You didn't mature in Christ Jesus. You have neglected what God gave you to do. And it's a serious matter. But you see, that's how that happens when people are neglectful. And often they really think that the secret is in not doing any material, physical fleshly sin and so they may or may not come to church they may sit on the pew but so far as doing something they may not ever quite get it that they are sinning the most dangerous sin because it doesn't jump out at them in fact I think that that's the first reason that I'd say that sin is so dangerous because it's so deceptive. If you start committing a lot of the fleshly sins, the ones that we would have put high up on that list of bad sins, somebody's going to get excited about it. If you kill somebody, if you rape someone, if you do those kinds of things, you're going to hear some, some sirens. You're going to see some police who've got handcuffs. You're going to meet a judge. Somebody gets excited about that. If you rape someone, that girl's daddy, that boy's daddy may come and take your life. You say, well, that'd be sin. Yes, sin begets sin. Nevertheless, when those kinds of things happen, somebody gets alarmed. And, and the alarms go off and people get excited and it's in the newspaper. But when you're neglectful, it doesn't make the paper. Nobody gets excited. Basically, we get to the point, even in the church, when people do not fulfill the commands that the Lord gives, we, we tend to say, well, oh, um, I mean, uh, some, some people just never quite seem to grow. And so what harm are they doing I mean, they're, they're not hurting anybody. And we let, I mean, how deceptive that is to act like it doesn't make any difference that people neglect the commands of God. That's very, very deceptive because the day of judgment is going to call it up and uh, we'll have to give an account. A second reason I would say is because it requires no effort. Just Absolutely nothing. If you're going to rob the bank, I'm not suggesting you do, but if you're going to rob the bank, wouldn't you have to lay some plans? Wouldn't you have to scope it out, see what bank, see what the hours are, see, see where the best way to come in, the best time, where the security is, or if they have security? You, you'd have to go through some trouble. You, you'd have to maybe find a getaway car or two, and you might need an accomplice, and there'd be all things that you, you'd have to do. If you're going to commit adultery, you've got to lay some plans with someone and you've got to go hide and you've got to, you, you got to lie and you've got to cheat and you've got to try to keep it covered. And, and there's a, I, I, I don't want to have to go through that. I just wouldn't want to have to try to cover up for that at all. 
But you know you got to. But if you're going to be neglectful, you don't have to put forth any effort at all. You don't have to lay any plans. You don't have to get any help. You don't have to bring somebody else in. You don't have to trust anybody else. <laughs> you just don't do anything. That's too easy. And yet, it's attractive. Deceptive. And, and it requires no effort, so it's so attractive. And besides that, the neglect thing is at the root of so many other sins. Your mom, did your mom ever say to you that idleness is what? The devil's workshop. Idleness is the devil's workshop. My dad had a saying and I never did like it. But I mean, I kind of thought it was insulting but my dad was like that. He said, young boys are like young mules. See, that's where I started taking offense. But he did know his own offspring, so leave it there. Uh, he said, if they don't have anything to do, they will get out and get in trouble. Cindy, you don't know mules that well. <laughs> but that's true, isn't it? Idleness. We create things to do that aren't good, not right, whenever we're just sitting around with nothing to do, Id idleness. Well, here's what the Bible says. In Proverbs 24, beginning in uh, verse 30, the wise man observed, I passed by the field of a sluggard. That's a lazy man. I passed by the field of a man who's neglectful. He wasn't taking care of his business, wasn't taking care of his farm, wasn't plowing, wasn't weeding, wasn't doing the things that he ought to do. I passed by that vineyard of a man who was lacking sense. He said, that's not very smart. But I passed by and his ground was covered with nettles. First he says, behold, there was, it was overgrown with thorns. It was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken down. And then I saw and considered the whole thing and I looked and, and received instruction a little sleep, a little slumber, a little hold, folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want and like, like an armed man. Idleness, but it doesn't take any industry to neglect, to just say ho-hum, let it go, and people sleepwalk through life with the impression that I think I'm okay because I don't lie, steal, cheat. I, I'm not doing the things that other people do. Remember that, that Pharisee in Luke chapter 18 who said, Lord, I thank you I'm not like other people, like this man here who's, who's saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> I, I, I'm better, you, it's like he's saying, you're sure lucky to have a guy like me. But he didn't do anything either. It's a dangerous sin because it's so contrary to Christianity. It's a direct dichotomy. Because Christianity is an active doing, serving, helping religion. People who practice Christianity care for their brothers and their friends and they help feed the poor and the hungry, the widows and the orphans. They just care. And the Lord tells us there's two parts, two sides, as it were, to Christianity. In James chapter 1, verse 27, James says, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, 
to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions, that's the positive side, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Oh, it's, it's fine that somebody's not indulging in fleshly sin. Yeah, that's, that's right, that's appropriate. But he's supposed to be doing something positive. He's supposed to be serving and helping. That, when those two things fit together, that's the picture of Christianity. But to just say, well, I'm not doing anything bad, and so I'm neither doing anything good, lulls an individual into self-satisfaction, causes him to think I'm okay with the Lord, but the scriptures don't teach that. We go back to that passage in Hebrews chapter 2. How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Those people who are like that don't have hope. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul the apostle writes encouraging the Christians saying, you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer eternal destruction and separation from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power forever and ever, he's saying this is a bad, bad scene. When people who didn't obey, who didn't serve, who fell into the trap of neglect and didn't recognize I'm deep, deep in sin because I'm not being active and faithful. I'm not attending like I should. I'm not praying like I should. I'm not teaching other people. I'm not helping the poor. I'm not helping and supporting the church. Whenever we realize that, we have to realize there's another side of Christianity that we've been ignoring, at least neglecting. And that sin will damn our soul unless we wake up. We're going to sing a song of invitation if you need the prayers of the church for anything. If you're ready to become a Christian, we're ready to help you with that. But we invite you to come while we stand and sing.